Yes. So for our first session today, we have Dr. Anindya Sarkar with us, who will be speaking on uh, the topic IP education towards knowledge space or market space, marketplace. I'm sorry. Uh, just a brief introduction of Dr. Sarkar. He's currently the IPR chair professor at Nalsar University of Law and is engaged in consulting, strategizing, teaching and training programs in the field of IP management. Before his engagement with Nalsar, he was working as the head of IP with Infosys Limited and was responsible for IP activities of the company and its subsidiaries. He is also a registered patent agent and a certified patent valuation analyst and has the unique distinction of having two PhDs, one in the field of law and the other in the field of science. We have with us someone who actively participates in patent awareness programs and other programs involving search techniques for patent and commercial information. He also speaks frequently at several industry forums including conferences, workshops, and has written and co-authored several papers and articles in national and international journals, conferences, and books. He also holds over 20 patents. So I think more glowing remarks about sir can be made, but that would perhaps take over all the time of the webinar that we have today. So sir, over to you. We would love to hear your, uh, your take on IP education towards knowledge space or towards a marketplace. Over to you, sir. Uh, good morning and a warm welcome to all of you. So the first session is uh, what we thought would should focus a little bit on, on the academics and how training, how the awareness programs are going all through. Is it really meeting the demands of the market? See, as we all understand, uh, IP is actually a blend of uh, legal services, science and technology, and also management. So we believe that, you know, that a successful and a good IP professional uh, should have a mix or a blend of all of them. Okay? Maybe in varying uh, levels, in varying depth, but an exposure to those definitely makes them uh, a good IP professional. Now, what does an IP professional, what is the aim of an IP professional? You know, once somebody is educated, aware, and is capable of uh, handling IP issues, what are the options? You know, you, you have basically three options which are available globally. One is some of them prefer to be in academics and train and teach more people. Some would like to join law firms. And or IP firms today we have we have specialized IP firms which deal only with IP matters, and the third option, which is also very very uh, on the rise, is to become in-house counsels and join the corporate. Now, if you really look into the details of those, the requirements for all of them may not be very very similar, and as such, we are. Mm, on a situation where sometimes, you know, it's not all sides fits all situations. So let's look at where we stand now. See, today we have around 80,000 to 1 lakh students taking admission in law every year in this country. Now that, that's a huge number. Okay, we have the national law universities, 23 of them. We have several private uh, enterprises. We have several colleges. We have several universities which have law departments and which gives or which allows close to 1 lakh students to take admission in, in an LLB program. Which in turn results that today we have more than 20 lakh lawyers who are Fresh and young lawyers are who wants to make their terrain in this field of IP or another aspects of law. See, the is the role of law schools is the role of teaching, the role of teaching in different uh, colleges is just widening the ambit of human understanding, justice, 
or it's simply meeting, making people ready to win cases. So law education is not just, uh, you know, it is a little different from other educations in this country because there are influences, there are uh, guidance, there are requirements for a large number of agencies, much more than you do in maybe science or medicine. See, as such, any education in this country is controlled by the UGC. So the UGC has a has a guidance. Then we now have the Ministry of Commerce, DBID, looking into various IP program. Okay, NAC. NAC every you know, every institute needs a NAC accreditation, and so that's another part. It's Bar Council which sets up the syllabus, and you know, looks that the minimum standards are maintained. Then we have law commissions, and then we have the influence of courts, which is an ever increasing number of cases coming in, which which are to to a great extent essential for legal education. So that's where you know legal education. If you look at it, you know IP is a specialized part of the legal education, and that's how or that's where we stand. Now, if I take look into a circle inside the circle that is you know we're looking at uh, from the legal education going into a smaller circle inside and looking at ip education in search. so what are the current trends of ip education okay these are some of the facts which are uh, which are collected all through see uh, the most uh, challenging and the most critical ones is what i've tried to list out See, IP law is not a compulsory subject in many law universities and law colleges. Now that shouldn't bother us because we're sitting in Nalsar, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not that way here. But then when you're talking about one lakh students which are studying law, even if they do not practice uh, IP to a law as a full-fledged career, but there is an inherent need to have a certain exposure in that. So this is not really a compulsory subject. NLUs and national law universities have it as a compulsory course. But if you look at most of the NLUs, by most, all of them, all segment is taught in just one semester. Now, whether that, that has its own benefit, that has its that could have a few drawbacks as well. It's only a handful of universities currently which offer IP specialization in, in at the master's level. When when this is becoming a demanding career, probably this number should be increasing uh, to a great extent. We are happy and proud that at Nalsa we, we do offer masters, uh, IP specialization even in masters level. Now, if you look at, if you break up into the segments of IP, then we have an adequate experience, adequate number of case laws on copyright and trademark, which makes it easier, which makes it convenient, both to study and teach. Okay. Now, understanding, even saying that, you know, even having said that, I would say understanding copyright and trademark uh, in the digital environment is still a challenge. Okay? It's not something which is being looked into in a greater depth. Whereas if you look at patents, we do not have an adequate experience or case laws in this country. We have a large, high, num high reliance on foreign case laws. And, you know, in many of the cases, the courts in India, in a couple of cases, have, uh, have also relied on foreign case laws. If you look at trade secret, geographical indication, integrated circuit, semiconductors, protection of plant varieties, they are very, very new to many, even today. So where is the challenge in the education? You know, it's very easy to set a syllabus. And finding a teacher is the real challenge. If you want to include all 
have a compulsory IP education in law, all the large uh, universities or in technology schools, we might have a def, uh, find it a big challenge to have certain resources to do that. However, in today's world, this is one good benefit which has uh, come out of the pandemic. The world has now become a very small village and we have uh, the extensive use of the online system and then to some extent this could be addressed okay there is no compulsory component of ip in higher education and science courses okay although there are you know, as we go along we'll see that there are some places where it is given uh, due importance there are some elements which are taught in, to students but the trend to publish or perish is now has been changing to patent publish or prosper when we say patent publish or prosper the surprising part is that yet there is no formal learning to prosper ip by and large should be it should be a, like a joint venture between science and technology law and also management See, if you look at the current state, we have a mushrooming of startups happening. And for them to function effectively, IP law is a must for commercialization. See, I do consulting with a couple of startups. I visit a lot of uh, incubation, wonderful incubation centers, which have been set up um, by, at the various levels by government and a few private sectors also. Uh, and I have noticed in more than one cases when, when they want to raise money, at least at, uh, at a level B funding, through a, uh, you know, through a BC venture capitalist or through an angel investor or through, you know, mortgage and loan, uh, most of the time the question they ask is that what is the IP you have? And then, you know, I've seen startup owners running around and say, tomorrow I have a meeting with VC. Can you register some IP today? Now, this has happened because he did not give importance to IP or he was not even aware whether he held some IP or not. Well, this is some of, some of the things I thought, you know, which, which is going around so that we can address a few of them. If you look at the current research trends in IP, it's almost a non-starter. Why I say non-starter? If you look at the amount of publication, research papers, articles which come out from different uh, streams, different domains, the numbers which, which focuses on IP is very, very marginally low. Some teachings, research do happen in national law schools, do happen in IIT and IIMs. But, you know, that's, the number is very, very small compared to research happening in other domains. So we need to identify the needs of the country and probably do in-depth research. In them. And it's not only about patents and trademarks, which is, the, which is probably the more, uh, I mean, most practiced and the easier part. We need to have similar stuff on traditional knowledge, trade secrets, copyright, GI, land varieties, so on and so forth. Trade secret is, up, is something which is so important in the commercial world, but, you know, and, but this area, this sector gets so less uh, importance in, in both education and research. So the interface between science, law, and management in many situations is missing. So probably a coordination between researchers, scientists, industry managers would, re would result in identifying areas of research and drawing meaningful conclusions from the outcome. Yes, the DBIIT, IBR chairs are addressing and can address quite a few of them on their own or in partnership, and they are, they are doing their bit. However, you know, if law schools try to introduce a bit of management and technical components, it might be 
even better. And whether technical school and other institutes can enhance by introducing a bit of IP law in their curriculum, situation would definitely become a little more useful and better. What is about IP training? This is something I, I'm probably in this world in quite a few decades. And the worst part is we have had more seminar in the past 10 years than in the past 10 decades. And most of them are repetitive and general talk shows. They have very little focus on training and imparting skills which are lacking, which are important, and which could make a difference. There are not too many adequate training modules. And since IP is a very varying uh, you know, uh, subject, which has, which has a different take in different industry and different domains, it probably requires a strong segmentation of the target groups, whether it's pharma, biotech, ICT, engineering, manufacturing, so on and so forth. And I strongly feel there is also absolutely a need to train the legal practitioners, you know, who, who have missed the bus. I mean, when I say missed the bus, I mean they are not aware of IB to, to that extent. So there is a need, definite need for sensitization and interaction, even in judiciary. The good part is, you know, there's a, there, there's, a, there's a broad step, there's a unique step which has put our country at par with uh, several other countries, is the big step which has been taken by the Delhi High Court. They have set up an IP bench, you know, okay, two, not one. And then you have specialized lawyers who will be judges, who will be attending to only IP, IP cases. Now, that, that's a big step. No, but what, in a country like India, one such court in Delhi may not be uh, sufficient enough to uh, address all the issues. And the funny part is, this, the birth of this happened because of the abolition of IPAB. And there were a huge number of cases which were lying in IPAB, which now moved on to, uh, which has now moved on to several high courts. And, you know, it's only Delhi. Delhi has, uh, Delhi High Court has taken a leadership and probably, you know, we'll have other high courts following it. As I, as I already mentioned, the DBIIT, uh, IBR chair will continue to be focused on training. Uh, we would, uh, we at Nalsar have decided that we'll be training, uh, setting up several workshop and training programs, okay, which will be not like seminar or conference mode, it will be more on workshop for target groups and for uh, other, uh, you know, uh, domains, segmented domains at large. So, if you know, if some of you of the participants feel that you know, we could take our help, or you know, we can partner together for such programs in future. Now, the other part, the utilization of resource person uh, uh, from academia and practitioners, industry experts. So this, this is some encouraging, you know, it's just a couple of days back, the current chairman of UGC said that they're going to introduce industry specialists as professors, induct quite a lot of them in teaching. Well, that's, that's a very, very welcome and a bold step. And which I think the student community is going to benefit a lot. So what is the situation in corporations? That's companies where people uh, come out, the law of the IP students, the law students come out, or the techno technocrats come out and join. Well, first, keep in mind, in the last few years, the law schools in this country has been exponential. There has been tremendous increase in the popularity on the practice of law as a profession, it, which, which is a welcome sign, which is a welcome who want to become IB professional. And if you look at it, you know, if, we, if I don't know what the 
Professor Gangul is still around. Uh, when we started our career in IT, it was so difficult to explain to people what we do, including lawyers. Things have changed a lot. That's, that's the positive part of it. But since I showed you some numbers, the supply is at times much higher than demand. Having said that, I should also make a comment that even if the supply is much higher than demand, most of them are half-baked. Most of them are half-baked students. Law students do not prefer to do most of their internships in corporates. Okay. The preference is on law firms, which is not I'm not saying not bad, but it hits the corporate. So which which fills up a gap between the knowledge and the skills. The good part again is you know most, most students today are very very ambitious, and often you know earning becomes more important than learning, and this hits the corporation, which leads to a very high rate of attrition. Now that's what the student part of it. Now, an IP professional, when he goes to a corporate, what are the challenges he faces? The main challenge he faces the first time he gets into a situation where he has to manage risk. It's not. It's not only prosecution work. See, IP has two parts. One is value, other is risk. So, it's first time you're getting into a situation of managing risk which the exposure has not been high. Along with risk, you manage litigation. In big companies, you know, you're finding the right document at the right time, you, you land up in a situation where you have hundreds of mails. One needs to manage external law firms. Some of them are uneasy with the newer technology. It's not that they are not capable. The exposure to those newer technologies are not there. Many firms, many corporates have their own IT system. Due to compliance, many of them are are forced to use a SAP-based technology, SAP-based technology to use it. The issues on cybersecurity, and there's globalization and you know global delivery model. This global delivery model, we should be proud because it's it's India which showed the world what is global delivery model. Where you work in a place <clears throat> in India and you deliver everywhere, mainly in the ICT industry. There are requirements of having sufficient knowledge of regulation and compliance. And in a corporate, you know, there will be numerous and numerous internal clients, and they will all of them will be very demanding. Now the corporations also have their own challenge. Okay, this challenge is uh in the global growth, in the secondary and the emerging market, managing the resource is a big issue. This, this issue has been never so big earlier. Companies which was which were at one time domestic, most of them are now global players. And thanks to the advancement of technology and internet and all of the facilities which we have. See, at a time when specialized talent is sometimes scarce, one size fits all recruiting strategy is no longer sufficient. Local recruits need knowledge at the global scale because you may be working in India, but you are servicing, or you are you need to attend IP issues in probably Europe or US or you know maybe Japan. And to handle all that, corporates are also facing uh, several challenges, you know, because labor regulations are constantly changing. And to sum it up, you know, leading businesses do not gamble with their global talent strategies. They do sufficient research, analyze, prepare meticulously, and then work out their strategy. So the in-house role is also a very, very, very lucrative role for IP professionals coming out. And let's see why they like it and what are the challenges there. 
in house rules usually is preferred because this is the road which finally leads to theses in organizations, but it's also sometimes you know not a preferred route because uh, because law firms continue to be better paymasters. There are only a very few multinationals who offer higher salaries when compared with you know the local firms. But whatever, but however, in-house rule does give you a better work-life balance. Should one be uh, interested in that? It has a few other, you know, very very distinct uh, so positivities. One is always a part of the strategic decision making process, and uh, is it? See the if you look at law firms now, the senior partners are more focused on business development. They are more spending more time in developing business rather than carrying out the legal work. Now this has become a necessity because of large number of firms, huge competitions, and then in a in, with higher targets in mind. Now these things are lacking when you are in an in-house role. In-house role further allows you to fill gaps in business decisions, own up assignments which are there in the organization, and at the same time allows you to see the outcomes of the, res of the result of your work very closely. It gives you a lot of opportunity to have a direct interaction with your client. Law firms are increasingly having reduction in budget in certain activities which do not touch the in-house role. And comparatively, in a, on a larger scale, may not be 100%, but to a very large extent, compensation is treated very differently in 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 house in corporates, they're more dependent on skill, scale, size, and the need of the company. And when you are in an in house role, the biggest thrill, the biggest thrill which one can enjoy is you work directly with the senior folks. You work directly with the CXOs, the management, the company board. So you have, you are close and you contribute to your level, to your extent, on the real business decisions of the company. Now that's, that's, uh, that's something thrilling, not only thrilling, that's something which is very, very learning. It enriches the skills to a very, very large extent. Okay. And that's what uh, uh, may be preferred or may be a choice for uh, quite a few of the folks coming out of college. So what should we do? It's, it's not my fault, it's their fault, his fault. It's not a blame game. It's not at all a blame game. It's not, you know, we, we should, I mean, we, we can blame whomever. We can blame the university, the teachers, the student, the curriculum, everything around us. But this blame game is not going to take us. The point is, Let's let's understand there is a gap, and that gap needs to be filled. And if this if we fill the gap, probably we are going to have a better and a much better resource coming up uh, in in the days to come. So are there gaps? See, there are some gaps. There are some gaps which have been filled. There are some gaps which needs to be filled, and the people are working on it. Now, who? So I have just tried to put down two two aspects here: one from the student's perspective, another from well, for the others. So that's the teachers, the corporates, the law firms. See, and I strongly feel that you know motivation can never be instilled from outside. Motivation to do, to study, to educate yourself, to make yourself a better IT professional has to come from the academic system. It's not a rush for marks and attendance. 
There are a lot of students who would like to enrich their knowledge and would not be, be genuinely interested in that. And uh, you know, it's not a rush for marks and attendance. And yes, in some cases, the system appealed the students. And we cannot have dictatorship in the name of discipline. You know, discipline. There is a system which is going on. And many of this because of the increasing pressure and the uh, different resources and avenues which are available at our hand, what has that led to? Shortcuts, shortcuts, and loads of shortcuts. Cut, copy, paste, and Google, in many cases, have ruined the meaning of research projects. There is, why, you know, I mean, although we have built up system in most of the uh, advanced law schools where there is plagiarism checks being done by several commercial tools, but then, you know, this, this, this on the larger scale is hitting uh, projects, research projects in a large way. And not to mention again, you know, we, we do lack research culture in India when it comes to IP. When you compare it with others, there are some people, there are some individuals, some pocket institutes who are doing a great job, but on a large scale, there is a recognizable and a noticeable gap. Probably we can try to close this gap between the book, law, and practice. And that's what is going to be our aim under this DBID chair in Nalzar to try and close this gap with the book and the law and practice for students of Nalzar and for other students of other, other law schools and colleges as well. Some suggestion for the students? Develop some curiosity towards everything and everyone around you. And don't be slavish for marks and attendance. I'm not saying everybody's after marks and attendance, but they do play a large role in the student's life. At an earlier stage, the initial days of your, of your career, you know, you can give uh, learning also equal importance uh, to earning. Plan appropriate internship and increase your focus on technology. These are some of the things which came to my mind, which could uh, largely uh, make some influence in the normal practice. At this moment, you know, I'm very tempted to quote a former president, uh, Dr. Abdul Kalam, in one of his talks, he had mentioned, a student can learn much more from a mediocre teacher than he can learn from the best teacher. So it is a coverage, it's a system, it's, it's the inbuilt discipline, it's, it's the motivation and it's the interaction, which is more important than, you know, than just finishing the syllabus. Now, uh, just to end my presentation, I would like to quote uh, Michel Greco, you know, who was, of course, the former president of the American Bar Association. He said that, you know, lawyers are always going to the students. Because the learning doesn't stop in law school. The irony is that when we become lawyers, we not only continue to be students, but we simultaneously are also teachers. Now, I, I believe, you know, there's so much of truth in this two sentences, which, you know, Michelle said, and there's so much of value in these two sentences, which can really make some differences in the days to come. I think uh, with that, I would, like to stop and
I thank you all for being a being patient and being such a nice participant. If there are some questions, I would love to take them. Thank you for sharing your insights, sir. There are indeed uh, questions in the chat box, so I'll probably just read them out if that's okay with you. Sure. Yes. So Dr. Sukhdeo asks, what are the possible solutions to address challenges in imparting intellectual property education? This I think is in addition to the last slide that you presented on how we can probably transform legal education and how the industry can provide certain incentives to law students and practicing lawyers as the case is right now. Well, you know, Dr. Sunday, I think there is no end to, to the efforts one can put. Okay. What we need is a larger participation. So solution is to educate people, make them aware. See, everybody is not going to become an IP professional. Okay? And that's absolutely fine. But being aware of certain aspects of IP is just going to make a sufficient uh, you know, difference in their life. Now, this could start, if you really ask me, it should start much lower. Okay. We shouldn't open, you know, wait till master's uh, level specialization in IT. Or why should it be only in law schools? Why only some, some IITs are doing it? There would, should be some exposure hmm, to that understanding of it. Now, the, the exposures can come from various fields, from various cooperations. What's important is not what we do. The most important is a larger participation. As I said, you know, these training programs are going on for decades. But the participation is on a, with a limited group. If you have a larger participation, probably this can improve a lot. That's my take on it. Is there anything else? Thank you, sir. I think that indeed answers that question. We also have another question by uh, Mr. Janardhan, who asks, what is the relevance of practical application of IP knowledge in the domain of business activities in practice of technology before and after the release of the product or technology? Well, the, the relevance is very high and the relevance is much, much higher before. When I say before, uh, she wants, there is, you start with an idea. The idea leads to a solution. It could be a product or a process. Now that product and process can be, can match an existing product also. If you have developed a product process or your research outcome is something which contains IP and is capable of being protection in whatever means. It could be, you know, it could be a copyright, it could be a patent or whatever means then that should be done much, much before you commercialize it. Otherwise, your whole, your monopoly, whatever you are planning will be lost. So the prosecution part, the protection part should be blindly done before commercialization. After commercialization is the monitoring part and the enforcing part. That is, if somebody is trying to violate or infringe your IP, you take adequate steps and take it forward. Okay, so that you are not deprived. Does that answer your question, sir? It does? It certainly does, sir. Yes. So we have two more questions, sir. If if that's okay with you. Yeah, yeah. We can we can make it short. Yes. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Bamsi Krishna asks, will we really see an IPR boom in India, given that it is at an infant stage, and there are local markets infringing products? So, 
do you think that there will be an IT boom specifically in India? It all depends on, on my on mass participation. Okay. We had a software boom in India because every, every student wanted to become a software engineer. Every company wanted to do business in software because they saw a future, they saw a revenue in that. Now, similarly, if more organizations see value in IT, and because uh, it is it is going to uh, i don't see why it should not happen secondly the important point here is what you want to do as a business what is your business model okay if you are continuously making a me to product you might have a higher revenue but that will not lead to it you have to come up with novel products novel processes which has I? Does that answer your question? Yeah, fine. We have one more. We'll take it quickly. Yes, sir. So this is more uh, formal, I suppose, where he asks, how can patent professionals become patent valuer or auditor? What is the process? Uh, so the, there are courses, okay, there are proper courses which makes you a patent valuer or a pay, uh, which uh, teaches you how to put a value. Now, uh, basically these courses are designed for intangibles where patent is one of them. Now, they, they, well, there are people who are interested in this or who would like to do a career in that can become a patent. Uh, value by carrying out, you know, undertaking those courses. And the, uh, but the best way is, is you learn on the job. If you're part of a team who does that, you learn it much better. Now, your question about an auditor, these are, uh, these are basically technology transfer experts, which look, which find, uh, goes and does an audit on the patent portfolio and uh, there is a uh, basically a due diligence exercise and uh, you know comes out with whatever report uh, that's necessary okay fine so i think we have time for one more question if that's okay sure. with you sure uh so Apoor Pragya asks, uh, with respect to research in intellectual property, can you probably tell us about the opportunities and challenges that doctrinal and empirical methods of research present? That's a, I would say the challenges are no, no, not, uh, not any different for uh, IP research when you com compare to research in others. But, you know, IP research is a little different in the sense uh, you might require a bit of technical understanding. Okay. Suppose you are getting into a research on the IP areas of, you know, let's say mobile phone or, you know, or a pharmaceutical product or, you know, aircraft engine. Uh, if you have uh, a bit of technical understanding, uh, it would have, it would be easier for that person. I certainly agree, sir. I having researched in IP myself, I also think that having a certain base of technological knowledge is certainly essential for us to carry out any uh, research in intellectual property. So, can you also tell us, us as students, what we can, what are the particular steps that we can probably take to ensure that our research in IP is more holistic and is more uh, well founded, so to say. I think for the first important thing is to identify an area where research is required, where the research outcome is going to be used and being beneficial. Not see, uh, uh, rather than being an abstract research or a review of, of things. Those are areas which will, if the research outputs are good, they are adopted by industries. And some of the times, you know, they're not just adopted, they are bought by industries. So that's, that's one way to look at it. Okay. Thank you so much, sir.
I understand that we've uh, run out of time. So are there any parting thoughts that you'd like to share with us today? Uh, there's no part, no parting thought that way. You know, my thought is, you know, my, my life is uh, nothing but IP. So for many years, so I would only say that, uh, we, we are very serious here uh, under this chair to do, carry out various program. So do reach out to us. If you think you could benefit from us or you, if you would like to partner with us. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir.